Coming up today, America's Blade Runner, the extraordinary Blake Leaper. We're in Budapest for the inaugural World Urban Games. Putting the joy back in gymnastics, we get the lowdown on America's Caitlin Ohashi. And we look back on the remarkable life of Paralympic athlete Marika Vervoort. I was born with a congenital birth defect fibular hemimilia. The doctor said I would never walk. You're always singled out, you, you get picked on, picked last, laughed at. I would be running around and playing sports, my leg would fall off and I had to find the willpower and determination to, to get back up and put my leg on even though I was embarrassed. I'm disabled, but as of right now, I'm the fifth, sixth fastest man in the world. I just hate what comes with that word, disabled. Because you are disabled, you're only able to do A, B, C, and D. The reality of it is I can do anything that I set my mind to. That's my message. That's what gives me motivation when I'm out here on the track, training and running. If you're getting laughed at, picked on, or being told no, I hope they can see my story and say, wow, Blake is competing against the fastest runners in the world. Imagine what I could do. Drake Stadium at the University of California in Los Angeles has been home to many of America's greatest athletes including legendary track and field stars Jackie Joyner-Kersey and Allison Felix. Blake Leeper is an athlete with similar aspirations. Fighting stigma, injustice and disability, Blake is proof that individuals with serious disabilities can not only compete, but can do so at the very highest level. with you know, the support from my family members and my, my older brother, my grandfather, my grandmother, everybody's still, you know, rallying around me to kind of make sure I live a, a normal, healthy life. Um, I started just playing basketball and baseball as a kid. Uh, I went to high school, went to college, and by the time I got to college, that's when actually I seen Pistorius run for the first time on TV, and I was like, wow, there's, there's something out there for me. Like Pistorius before him, Blake runs on specially designed prosthetic blades, allowing him to compete on the Paralympic stage. I got my first pair of blades and started, you know, playing with them and started training a little bit and I, and I, I kept getting better and I kept getting better and I qualified for my first national championships and then by 2011 I actually uh, tied uh, Pistorius' world record in 100 meters with a 1091. By doing that, that kind of would, like solidified saying, wow, I actually have a shot. Leeper has continued to excel on the track. In 2018, he ran the fastest ever 400 meters by a double amputee. And at this year's US Track and Field Championships, he finished fifth in the final of the men's 400 meters, racing against able-bodied athletes. Blake is currently coached by former sprinter and NFL legend Willie Galt, who enjoyed a successful career as a wide receiver with the Chicago Bears and the Los Angeles Raiders during the 80s and 90s. Now an athletics coach, Willie is helping Blake try and achieve his dream of competing against able-bodied athletes at the Olympic Games. It's always been his goal to compete against regular people uh, because he is regular. When I first, we first started working together three years ago, I didn't see him as a disabled person. And I saw him as a person who willing to work hard, dedicate his time and his energy to something and try to achieve a goal. And he's worked really hard those, these past three years to try to accomplish that. I mean, the fact that he is running against able bodies and he has a, a, this disability, uh, votes well for the disability community that, to know that they can do anything they want. Blake is now fighting the sport's governing body, the IAAF, to allow him to race against able-bodied athletes. If he succeeds, 
he could be competing for the US track and field team at the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. Oscar Pistorius was the first one who started this and he was, he was able to run in the 2012 Olympics and hopefully Blake will have the same success hopefully and be able to have the opportunity. There's only been one case, that's Oscar, and they, he was allowed to run, so Blake should be allowed to run. Another key member of Blake's team is his trainer and manager, Johan Stefansson. Johan oversees Blake's physical conditioning, preparing him for the rigors of racing against some of the world's best athletes. He is just one of the fastest and most hardworking men in, in the world now. He has, like people are talking about, you know, it's the Blake, but it's not, it's just brutally hard work. And he, he's working probably harder than anybody out there. Blake follows a unique training plan to accommodate his needs as a double amputee. We have to change up a few things because he doesn't have calves, he doesn't have ankle joints. So there's a lot of things that we have to change there. We, we just tried a lot of things and we are on a pretty good routine now. It's challenging, but it works. We had a lot of, a lot of bumps in the roads on the way, but he kept on coming, kept on coming. And you know, that, that's, that's what makes champions. Those bumps in the road are the other side of Blake Leaper's story. Even when he was winning medals and enjoying success on the track, Blake was also battling a decade-long addiction to alcohol and drugs. Deep down, I was, I was searching. Um, you know, I was trying to figure out what, you know, the meaning of life, who, you know, who I am as a person, trying to wear this cape of, of being the face of the, dis you know, disability or, you know, trying to, trying to inspire a generation. I was in a deep, dark place, hanging out with the wrong people, you know what I mean, doing a lot of partying, you know, indul unfortunately indul indulging in, you know, in drugs and, and drinking a lot, and, and to the point where I just spiraled out of control. Um, and, and then I ended up, you know, trying to pull it back together, but I couldn't. It was so tough to get myself out of that position until I hit my rock bottom. Um, and, and, my, and my rock bottom is when I tested positive in the 2015 National Champ Paralympic National Championships for cocaine. That failed test threatened to overshadow all Blake's earlier successes at the Paralympic Games and left him at rock bottom. Honestly, that was the lowest point in my life. I lost sponsorships, I lost support. Uh, I was dropped by my leg sponsor, so literally I lost my legs. I made a huge mistake, but the most important thing I learned is what are you going to do after that mistake? Life is not about how hard you can hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. It's about how hard you can take hits and keep pushing forward. And those days where I was suspended and you know I didn't have that much money in my bank account because I lost sponsorships and, and people you know lost their belief in me and, and people was talking bad about me, I still had to wake up. And, and, and suit up and put my legs on and show up at the track and train like I was a champion. Um, and, and I was determined to, 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 to make right, to make amends and, and, and to get my life back on track. With his addiction troubles behind him, Blake Leeper is determined to be a role model for people struggling through adversity. He's also hoping to inspire a generation of disabled athletes by becoming one of the fastest men in the world. Take away, you know, even when, I'm, when it's all said and done, and, and I'm gone, and, and, and my name gets popped up in the conversation, I just want people to look at my story and look at my life and say, "Wow, he was a fighter! Like, wow, that kid fought. He gave it 
all that he had and what through the through the ups and downs you know through the disability through the addiction through, through all of it he never quit and so by them identifying that is that that mindset of never quitting regardless of the situation that that you're in that i fought through it all that can maybe give them some a little inspiration and hope and saying wow if blake fought i can fight too so whatever situation i'm going through i'm gonna push through it that's what i want people to take away that's what i want people to understand about my life Now it's time for our sporting question. This week, the world's best disabled athletes are in Dubai for the World Para-Athletics Championships. Among the likely medal contenders is Great Britain's Samantha Kinghorn, who'll be racing in the T53 100 meters and the universal 4x100 meter relay. Kinghorn achieved a remarkable sprint double at the 2017 World Championships in London, where she won both the 100 and 200 metres in the T53 class, setting a world record in the final of the 200 metres in the process. The 23-year-old will be hoping to successfully defend her 100 metre title in Dubai. For this week's question though, we'd like to know which Paralympic athlete, male or female, has recorded the fastest ever time in the 100 metres in any classification. We'll bring you the answer later in the show. The World Urban Games is a celebration of new generation sports like no other. 2019 saw the first ever edition of the Games take place in the Hungarian capital Budapest. The community is the best part of the Games and, uh, and new people get know this. Blending competition with urban culture, the inaugural event brought together athletes from all over the world for a three-day spectacle of sport. All the showcase sports, all the competition sports, all the, all the additional acts were, were totally amazing. And uh, we really liked how the crowd reacted on, on all the sports because urban sports are mainly for, for teenagers and youngsters, but we had uh, from age one till 99. Another goal of the Games was to revitalize a rundown area of the city, with the indoor events held in a huge disused hall dating back to the 1930s. It's a historical building, and all the venue is uh, quite abandoned a couple of years ago. But uh, the reason behind it is just to bring it back to the city life, and all the urban sports and the current generation is, is absolutely in line with this atmosphere in the venue. Featuring six competitive sports and two showcase disciplines, the aim of the Games was to bring lesser-known urban sports to the masses. It's been absolutely amazing to be here at the World Urban Games. Um, such an honor to represent both my country and also the sport that I love so much. We begin our look at the inaugural World Urban Games with a couple of showcase sports that you might not have heard of before. Combining running and shooting, Laser Run is a test of speed and accuracy. The final event in a regular modern pentathlon, this dynamic discipline became a standalone sport in 2015. At the World Urban Games, a number of Laser Run's leading athletes were invited to take part in a modified sprint format. Competitors had to complete four rounds of laser pistol shooting and run four laps of the 400 meter course. Each round of shooting requires athletes to hit a target five times as quickly as possible. Egypt's Ahmed Al-Gendi is a rising star in the world of modern pentathlon. 
Last year, he enjoyed an incredible season, securing junior and under-19 world titles, as well as winning the men's individual gold at the Youth Olympics in Buenos Aires. As this was just a showcase race at the World Urban Games, there were no titles or ranking points up for grabs, but the 19-year-old's sharp shooting and speed on the ground saw him win the inaugural event. This format in the Urban Games, it's, um, it's a new format for the laser run. It's the half race, so it's very speedy. I'm so happy to compete in this new format and also very proud and happy to, uh, to, uh, to represent Egypt in the first edition of the Urban Games here in Hungary. Keep an eye out for Ahmed in the modern pentathlon at next year's Tokyo Olympics. Another showcase sport on display at the inaugural World Urban Games was indoor rowing. A competitive discipline in its own right, the first World Rowing Indoor Championships took place just last year. And up they go. The history of the rowing machine dates back to the 4th century BC, when inexperienced oarsmen used wooden machines to perfect their technique. At the World Urban Games, 16 of the world's best showcased their speed and strength on slightly more modern rowing equipment. Indoor rowing is obviously on a concept to rowing machine and um, there's a whole range of different workouts that can be done but in the World Championships usually people compete in the 500 metres, 1k or 2k. Uh, at this showcase event specifically there's a whole range of workouts that have been uh, given to us and um, yeah we just go head to head with other people competing on the rowing machines. That's it for now from the World Urban Games but we'll be back for more from Budapest later in the show. The town of Châteauroux in France welcomed the world's best pilots for the 30th FAI World Aerobatics Championships. Ten days of competition featuring incredible feats of aerobatic skill. Local crowds turned out in force and they had plenty to cheer about with French pilots dominating proceedings. We have between 50,000 and 80,000 spectators. That means that the total for the event is between 150 and 180,000 spectators or something like that. So the audience is there. On the sports side, we've had fantastic results because all the pilots are happy. They are pleased to compete in front of so many people. They are happy because there has been fair play between the pilots and the judges. And of course for us, the French public, we're particularly pleased because we have walked away with practically all the medals, notably the medal for the overall title and the gold medal for the team event as well. 62 pilots were competing for individual and team titles with entrants coming from 18 nations, including the USA and Australia. Oh, it's amazing. I was here in 2015 and it was an incredible event. Had a lot of fun, great hospitality, really well run. And it's the same thing this time around. I mean, it's a, they're doing an amazing job here. It's great to see all the spectators. Yeah. So, yeah it's been a fantastic event. Jotaru was amazing. The venue was amazing. The people are amazing. Uh, Organisation was amazing. I, I can't find any flaw with it. Uh, only flaw actually would be my flying. I wish I flew better, actually. Over the course of 10 days of competition, each pilot performed four routines, with the judges assessing each flight on its execution and difficulty. In the women's event, France's Aude Lemardon regained the title she won at the 2015 edition. It was really special for me, you know, to be back again in Châteauroux, because last time I won the title. And so I think it was really stressful for me, you know, because I really wanted well, to keep it here, of course. But uh, we were really lucky, have good, uh, good weather, many flights, and it was just perfect. Defending men's champion Mikhail Mamistov from Russia was expected to challenge again in the singles category. He was well placed after his first two flights, but a disappointing penultimate run ended his title chances, eventually finishing third in the standings. 
The championships here in France were held as always at a very high level, so I'm very glad that I could come and take part. The flights were remarkably well organized and the weather was ideal. I really enjoyed the flights themselves. The French pilots are definitely the leaders now though. Unfortunately, I was not able to compete at the highest level, so could not get first place in either the team or the individual competition, but hopefully we can compete in the future. I'm very glad that I managed to participate in this championship. It's a wonderful country with wonderful aviation traditions and many great pilots. French pilot Alexander Orlovsky was hoping to regain the title he won four years ago and had to settle for second place. It was a great championship, quite long, 10 days, uh, with uh, four flights, but also a lot of uh, waiting before the flight. So it was a, a nervous game also between uh, all, the, all the pilots. Uh, sure, I was very happy to, to fly here in Châteauroux because it was my first competition uh, in 2015 with a very good result because I, I won it. Uh, I tried to do my best to, to try to do it twice. Uh, Louis was better, but uh, it was a, a good, uh, good fight with a good spirit, a lot of fear. So finally, uh, I, I know that a lot of all pilots did their best to, 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 to give uh, the maximum. And uh, after it's the sport, there is a winner. We did, did it, and I'm very happy for him. Orlovsky's compatriot Louis Varnell was the eventual winner. He led after the first program and never relinquished that lead. It's the realization of 10 years of flying for me. It's pretty huge. At the beginning of the championship, I didn't have too much pressure. I just did my job. And the most striking thing for me, what really changed, was at the end of the third flight, when I saw it was possible to win. I saw that I was first without much of a lead. That made it really hard to stay mentally focused on that fourth flight like I needed to be. Twenty-two-year-old US gymnast Caitlin Ohashi went viral earlier this year after her perfect 10 floor routine racked up over 118 million views online. Her joyous routine was voted the best play of the year at the ESPYs and captured the imagination of sports fans worldwide. We caught up with the former UCLA star to find out a bit more about her. I used to when I was growing up and then I was like, this is so idiotic and just <laughs> crazy. So I had to get out of it because I'm like, what does it matter what shirt I wear to bed? <laughs> and nothing. So yeah, no. One of my biggest pet peeves is when people don't use their blinker. I don't know why it really bothers me. And I'd say that's probably uh, stupid questions. <laughs> I have not had time to like watch anything right now, unfortunately. I'm trying to watch the third season of Stranger Things, but I'm also trying to force myself to read, so. <laughs> uh, Figures by Jesse, Jessica something, R. But it's, yeah, I've been playing that like a thousand times a day. <laughs> Yeah, there's uh, these two artists, Oshun, amazing. They're, it's like a goddess in Yoruba, but anyways, they resemble like self-love and nature and water. And there's this song called Me, and it's like all self-confidence. And that's what I always play before. I feel like uh, one of those like people that can morph into anything because then it's like if I had one superpower I can morph into something that has the capability to do other things so it's like you kind of get the whole package. Typically after meats I love to have burgers. <laughs> so so Miss Val actually just sent me a picture she was like a picture of me right after a competition and I'm like ah. 
ugh, biting into a juicy burger. <laughs> I've gotten a lot of get, like notes, which is really, really cool. Like something that really made my heart sing when I was just at Flip Fest this past week in Tennessee. I got so many little notes from the girls and it almost changed my perspective. Like I always feel like you can, it takes 30 seconds to change someone's life or not, but kind of like impact them. And so why not take that time? But even more so kind of got into my head when I was there that it literally is so easy to just help these girls and really like impact them. And the letters that I got were so cute and so sweet. And that's, that was a really good gift. My best skill probably would be talking. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, I would say probably poetry. Perfect vacation is probably me by myself. This sounds amazing. Oh my, I'm like, <laughs> so I have three nights for free in Turks and Caicos because it was one of the ESPYs gifts. And so I, my mom would kill me though. She would never let me go alone. But if I could go alone and just have like ca canvases, I can't paint, I'm not very artistic, but I just love the idea <laughs> of trying to. So just having canvases paint me a book right by the water doing that all day. The Kingdom of Bhutan is one of the most remote and isolated countries on Earth. Flanked by China and India, the world's most populous countries, Bhutan sits in the foothills of the Himalayas and is a nation defined by its unique culture. The majority of people in the Buddhist kingdom live a subsistence lifestyle in villages scattered across the mountainous landscape. <laughs> Life for the people of these villages can be very physically demanding. So whenever there's a public holiday, many villagers take the opportunity to relax by gathering to play traditional Bhutanese sports. One of the most popular sports is Kuru. Playing Kuru requires a strong arm and a lot of stamina and concentration. These are all qualities that most Bhutanese people have in abundance because of all the work we do on our farms. And I would say that it's physically a lot more demanding than it looks. In Kuru, two teams of seven throw large darts at a small target, roughly 20 meters away. A hit on the target counts as one point, and as hits are rare, it often only takes one to guarantee victory. It's believed that Kuru was once used as a way of training Bhutan's men to fight off potential invaders from neighboring countries. However, today, the game is played purely for fun. There's always a thrilling atmosphere and it's very exciting. It's like that in every sport we play, be it archery, kuru or dego. I think that's just how Bhutanese people play sport. I remember watching my father and I guess it just comes naturally. Most people who live in rural Bhutan toil on the land six days a week. This limits the time available for games like Kuru. And currently, it's most commonly played by men during their lunch breaks. This game has been played here for centuries. And unlike some other traditional Bhutanese sports, which are becoming less and less visible across the country, Kuru is undergoing something of a renaissance. Yes, 
In Bhutan, we have many traditional sports, and while many of them are disappearing, in my opinion, kuru is getting more popular. Not as popular as archery, but it has definitely become more popular than it was just a few years ago. Bhutan is a country that's proud of its cultural heritage. And as the land of the Thunder Dragon continues to embrace some aspects of modernity, Kuru is playing a vital role in preserving the customs and traditions of the Bhutanese people. When I was young, I remember how much fun it was playing Kuru, with the whole community enjoying time together. Recently, we've started to play more often again, which is great because it gives people like me the chance to pass on my enthusiasm for the game to the young generation. Welcome back to the inaugural World Urban Games held in Budapest, Hungary. The three-day multi-sport event was in full flow by the time the roller freestyle competition got underway. The sport sees skaters performing tricks and acrobatic routines in a purpose-built freestyle park, with each competitor receiving two runs of 50 seconds to try and impress the judges. We caught up with one of the world's best. Hey, I'm Joe Atkinson. I'm from Pontefract, West Yorkshire, and I'm the current world champion roller freestyle skater. I started skating when I was four years old, just skating down the street with my friends, and then my parents took me to the local skate park, and from there I was like, wow, this is insane. And uh, yeah, from there I was just like, yeah, stuck to it. And uh, now I'm here, 22 years later, as the world champion, coming to all these events, traveling 10 months a year. So yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Joe just missed out on a place on the podium at the World Urban Games as France's Roman Abrat claimed victory following a stellar first run. But for athletes in roller freestyle, there's other aspects of the sport that are just as important as the competition. As well as self-discipline, it's also, yeah, like pushing yourself and, and um, yeah, it's a very creative thing to be, to do, you know, and you're always like bettering yourself and, and learning new stuff and, yeah, it's, it's a really positive thing to be involved with. And it's also, it's a big uh, community, a big scene. It's, a, it's also about the social aspect. the most dynamic and exciting disciplines in the sports world today, parkour was a natural fit for the first edition of the World Urban Games. There were two different disciplines on display in Budapest, speed and freestyle. The speed event requires athletes to complete the course in the fastest time possible, while the freestyle event is judged on the most creative route taken through the obstacles. As with most of the sports on show here, parkour is high risk and injuries are commonplace. Luckily, some of the unsung heroes of the games were on hand to help out. These chiropractors travel to major sports events all around the world to assist with any niggles and injuries the competitors may have. One of the lesser known sports at the Urban Games was the flying disc freestyle. Competitors perform choreographed routines set to music and aim to impress the judges with their technical skills with the flying disc. Hi, I'm Emma from Seattle, Washington and I'm the current world champion freestyle frisbee player and also world urban games champion. There are various manoeuvres to master, including tipping, brushing and rolling, alongside more outlandish ways of throwing and catching the disc. 
Yeah, well, really it all just kind of evolved out of basic throw and catch, like exactly what you're familiar with, you know, see people playing throw and catch in the park. And then that evolved into like, oh, I can do a trick catch. I can catch it behind my back. I can catch it under my leg. Um, and then that evolved into, I can tip it before I do a catch. Or I can even delay the catch by spinning it on my fingernail before I do my catch. So sort of like, it just evolved very organically from just exactly what you're familiar with throw and catch. And over the years, people have developed more and more technical styles and technical moves um, till what we have today. Competitors were representing their nation in mixed pairs, with their routines combining various aspects of gymnastics and dance. Emma and her partner, Daniel O'Neill, wowed the crowd with their routine to win the inaugural Flying Disc Freestyle title. There's definitely a big push to keep growing the sport. A lot of forward momentum right now. Being here at this event is a huge step. Lots of people who have never seen our sport before are seeing it, and there's been a really great response, which is awesome. You know, you just start simple, under the leg catch, and you can just really grow from there. So I think it's definitely going places. Join us again on next week's show when we'll be taking a closer look at some of the urban events that will be making an appearance at future Olympic Games. And now for the answer to this week's sporting question. Earlier in the show, we asked you to name the fastest Paralympic athlete of all time. The answer is Jason Smith. The Irish sprinter competes in the T13 category for athletes with visual impairment, having been born with Stargardt disease, a condition which left him with limited peripheral vision. At the London Paralympics in 2012, Smith set a new world record of 10.54 seconds in the heats for the 100 metres. In the final, he went even faster, blowing the field away to win gold in a time of 10.46 seconds, a world record that stands to this day. The reigning world and Paralympic champion over 100 metres in the T13 class, Jason will be targeting a remarkable fourth straight 100 metre title at the World Para-Athletics Championships in Dubai this week. In October 2019, Belgian Paralympic athlete Marika Vervoort ended her life through euthanasia, following a long and painful battle with a degenerative muscular disease. The 40-year-old wheelchair racer enjoyed great success on the track, winning medals of every colour at the Paralympics. But away from the highs of her sporting achievements, she suffered daily with a form of progressive tetraplegia, causing her constant pain, seizures, paralysis in her legs, and left her barely able to sleep. In 2008, she signed papers allowing a doctor to legally end her life in Belgium, where euthanasia is legal. We met Marika in 2016. This is her story. I can't live with unbearable pain, especially when I think things are deteriorating further. Most top athletes quit because they get too old or because they're at the peak of their career and it's getting too much to train hard every day. With me, I had to quit because of my condition. I was set on committing suicide. Thanks to euthanasia, you know that you'll be able to die in a peaceful manner, without pain. I'm Marika Bevoort, I'm 37, and this is my life story. Over
Over the course of her distinguished career, Marika Vavort won three world titles and four Paralympic medals in the T52 classification for wheelchair races. She also completed the Ironman Hawaii Triathlon. But her sporting success masked a life of constant pain. She had a terminal spinal disease, which led her to sign euthanasia documents in 2008. We travelled to Diest in northern Belgium to meet her. In 2000, I ended up in a wheelchair, which was incredibly difficult for me. I just couldn't stand on crutches any longer. I wasn't walking properly anymore. I was just dragging my legs, really, moving the crutches forward and pulling my legs behind me. It was very tough at the beginning. They then discovered cervical nerve problems in my spinal cord. That's why I have lower paralysis and limited movement in my hands. But we still don't know the reason for the epileptic seizures, which caused me to stop breathing. The side effects of the disease were profound, but Marika refused to be a passive bystander. She completed a 60-metre bungee jump and loved indoor skydiving. However, athletics was always her biggest passion. What I like so much about wheelchair racing is the buzz it gives me. The moment you're on the start line and they say, on your marks, and then my heart beats like baboom, baboom. That is simply an incredible moment. And then, when the start gun is fired, from start to finish I push everything I have in my body onto those wheels. If I'm angry or frustrated, or if I'm worried about something, it suddenly disappears. I love it so much. It's fantastic. Marika reached the pinnacle of her sport in 2012. At her debut Paralympics in London, she won a silver medal in the T52 class in the 200 metres, before claiming gold in a Paralympic record time in the 100 metres. Against all the odds, she was a Paralympic champion. She would go on to win three world titles in Doha in 2015. But it was her two medals at the 2016 Rio Paralympics, following four years of increasing pain, that saw her make headlines around the world. It's been a very tough year. I was hospitalised many times and I had to skip several training sessions. But in the end, Rio was a very special event. My goal was to finish with two medals from my two events and that's what I did. I came home with silver in the 400 metres and bronze in the 100 metres. So that was simply incredible. It still hasn't sunk in really. I haven't fully come to grips with it yet. On the track, Marika succeeded on the biggest stage for disability sport. Off it, she required 24-hour assistance. As well as constant visits from nurses, she also had her help dog, which in homage to her Buddhist beliefs, she called Zen, meaning peace. Not only did Zen assist in Marika's day-to-day -day life, but she also helped to improve her mood. Oh, Zen is, is echt het Zen is the absolute best thing that has ever happened to me. She came into my life in 2008, a moment when mentally it was extremely tough for me. She helps me. She doesn't put emphasis on the things I can't do. Instead, the emphasis is on how she can enable me. For example, if I drop a Eurocent coin, she will pick it up for me. She takes off my socks and my jacket. If I fall down, I can give her the signal to start barking continuously so people come and check why she is making so much noise. If I get an epileptic seizure, she will sense it coming an hour in advance and she will start pacing around me in a very anxious way and she will not leave me alone. Zen, combined with Marika's dedicated support team, helped to make her days more bearable. However, the pain and suffering caused by her disease was always there. Good night, my love. 
In 2008, Marika was on the brink of suicide, scared of what the future might hold. But instead, she decided to sign documents, allowing a doctor to one day end her life. Euthanasia is legal in just a handful of countries around the world, one of which is Belgium. Paradoxically, those papers help to prolong Marika's life. I was really set on ending my life myself. I had collected all my medicines, and I was ready to take them all at once. But then I met Professor Distelmans, and he told me, Marika, you don't have to do it like this. There's a different solution. There's euthanasia. Since I got those papers, I got tremendous peace of mind. I was able to enjoy the little moments in life again, and that is why I continue to push my boundaries and why I am ultimately still here. Having settled the legal formalities, Marika now had control over the decision of when to end her life. During the final years of her life, Marika had daily appointments to monitor and nullify her pain. When we filmed with her, she was put on a drip for four hours to prevent cramping and fatigue. I'm feeling a bit tired right now. I didn't sleep well last night at all. And now that I'm lying here in bed, I think I'll close my eyes for a bit and have a little beauty sleep. I can feel my eyes going, so see you later. Bye-bye. Marika was determined to enjoy the rest of her life. She was blessed with a close network of people around her that not only assisted with her care, but who reveled in her good humour and optimism. She had also become something of an inspiration, not just to her friends, but to many people around the world. I always try to motivate people with my motto, believe you can. I want people to enjoy all the little moments in life. My aim is to inspire people. You cannot let your life pass you by. You cannot be some grey matter in the background. Take courage and believe you can. If you really want something and you believe in it, then you will succeed. But you've got to make it happen. Marika Vervoort overcame great adversity in her life to achieve incredible things. Her legacy is assured both as a sports person and as an advocate for the right to die with dignity and free from pain. I hope my story opens up the debate around the world about euthanasia again and people think about it in a different way. It's nothing like murder. It helps people. There will be fewer suicides and it gives people peace of mind. This is important, especially for the people that are left behind. Otherwise, they will always remember how the person they held so dear suffered when they passed away.